I want to say, first of all, thank you very much to the organizing committee. It's really a privilege and an honor for me to be able to present, um, both in this room and at LPUB20. I really do appreciate the opportunity to present what I think of as more of a, a think piece, so to speak, than a, perhaps a scholarly contribution to the field. Um, you see the question on the title, and um, the answer will come, I promise. But the article processing charges as a, as a means of offsetting publication expenses is, of course, not a particularly new feature on the scholarly communications landscape. One of the things I'm going to do is just give you a picture to look at if you wish. Um, I promise I have no other slides, so it's entirely just something to distract you. Uh, taken actually at the University of Alberta during Open Access Week, uh, we always ask design uh, um, students to, to propose ways of uh, visualizing open access, and I particularly like that one. It has nothing to do with my presentation, but it does give you something to look at. Um, in the wake of the Finch report and its subsequent implementation, of course, in the UK, um, I think there are, well, there are several research projects underway which seek to analyze the financial viability of providing open access more globally to academic journal literature. And one idea, of course, is to relate, replace many or all subscription fees with APCs, effectively to flip the system. And two of these research projects in North America, uh, I'm going to mention the first is in North America, um, are currently underway and I think worthy of comment. So the first, the University of California under the leadership of UC Davis and the California Digital Library, with support from the Mellon Foundation, is undertaking pay it forward investigating a sustainable model of open access article processing charges for large North American research institutions. Uh, the project includes partnerships with three other major research libraries. The rationale is articulated in the grant submission, which is available online, and I'm going to quote from it. The key question that the proposed project asks is whether a large-scale conversion to open access scholarly journal publishing funded via APCs would be viable and financially sustainable for large North American research intensive institutions whose faculty currently author a significant percentage of the world's research. Now similarly in Europe, or perhaps a little differently but somewhat similarly, a Max Planck uh, digital library open access white paper was published last year which is attracting a lot of attention in North America as well. And the white paper provides data to support the author's conclusion that a large-scale transformation of the underlying business model of scientific journals is possible at no financial risk. Our own data analysis shows that there is enough money already circulating in the global market, money that is currently spent on scientific journals in the subscription system, that could be redirected and reinvested into open access business models to pay for APCs. Both studies appear ready to indicate that large research libraries at least would realize a substantial economic gain on behalf of their parent institutions if APCs replaced subscription costs as the principal underlying business model for scientific journals. Well, I believe these two studies, and they are, I guess, ongoing, uh, present long-standing advocates for open access, such as myself, with a new challenge. Because it seems to me that a business model for scholarly communications largely or entirely based on APCs, whether or not it is financially advantageous to research-intensive institutions like my own, needs to be questioned. Does it not represent a substantial economic barrier to the authors, institutions, funding agencies, and governments that we would most wish to serve through open access initiatives. It is the concept of social inequality that seems to me not to be sufficiently well addressed by such business models. A system based on author payments 
continues to favor those affiliated with organizations that have the means to pay. Both philosophically and literally, no matter how low the charges, there will be authors, institutions, funding agencies, and governments unable to afford the cost of those APCs. This in itself is not an original insight. There's a seminal article by Peterson, Emmett, and Greenberg in the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication, in which the authors note that lurking behind the joy of reader gets free access are subtle assumptions and ethical dilemmas that arise on the author side of the equation, averting new inequities as the open access movement gains momentum is critical. And it seems to me, I'm going to just reference uh, Jean-Claude Jean Guedon's uh, keynote speech in saying open access at any cost becomes one of the questions that we are faced with. Inequities, seen and experienced, of course, very differently by different groups and even by different disciplines. In truth, I think the problem is even larger. Political scientists may legitimately argue that open access models proposing APCs form part of an unintended neo-colonialism. Or should that be neo-imperialism? I'm never quite clear on the difference. In which first world publicly and privately funded research smothers the work of academic researchers in developing nations, as well as the bona fide research of other excluded or underprivileged communities at home and abroad. Such an outcome would, I think, perpetuate and even reinforce an already well-documented system of discrimination by which important groups are denied the privilege of seeing their research disseminated through generally accepted vehicles of scholarly communication. Now, APCs do address many of the financial concerns that have been used by open access advocates ever since the movement was founded. Sadly, however, it seems to me that they provide a route to satisfying the terms of some of our foundational documents, such as the Berlin Declaration on Open Access and the Budapest Open Access Initiative, without solving the more knotty problem posed by social inequality. Thanks to the internet, I think most of us would agree that there is no longer any technological justification for this. And I've heard the financial argument that if APCs were adopted in place of subscription costs, then research institutions would save so much that they could collectively repurpose a portion of the savings to address any of these inequities in the new system. Unfortunately, in addition to being vulnerable, I think, to all kinds of ethical pitfalls, there is also insufficient evidence that this rebalancing has taken place in the current subscription-based environment where it would be seen to be equally valid. Stronger arguments may be based on the real danger that without APCs, we're left with an untenable status quo. We've heard a lot about the untenable status quo at this conference. I don't think there's an easy answer to this, but I do think that one way to uh, create a theoretical framework, if you wish, around this topic is to look at disruption theory. Many of you will know that disruptive innovation is a much discussed business term coined by a Harvard Business School professor, Clayton Christensen. He defines it. Disruptive innovation describes a process by which a product or service takes root initially in simple applications at the bottom of a market and then relentlessly moves up market, eventually displacing the established competitors. Now, in my opinion, open access was originally developed as a proposal that would lead to exactly that kind of disruptive innovation, i.e. allowing new market entrants, specifically open access journal publishers, to displace established subscription-based rivals. An open access world based on APCs, by contrast, appears instead 
to meet Clayton Christensen's definition of a sustaining innovation. Disruption theory, he says, differentiates disruption innovations or disruptive innovations from what are called sustaining innovations. The latter make good products better in the eyes of the incumbents. The fifth blade in a razor, the clearer TV picture, better mobile phone resources, reception. These improvements can be incremental advances or they can be major breakthroughs, but they all enable firms to sell more products to their most profitable customers. Setting aside the many obvious differences between academic and commercial business, well, maybe not so obvious, but anyway, it does seem possible to assert that an open access world based on APCs would make the journal article look more attractive in the eyes of the current incumbents, the existing customers, by providing more value for money. But like all sustaining innovations, it might also maintain a kind of exclusive status quo for both market incumbents and for their customers, the large and wealthy research intensive institutions. If the widespread and large scale adoption of APCs doesn't provide an optimal route to open access environment because it fails to address the issue of social inequality, what is the better path? Well, that's a really challenging question. I believe it can only be answered by first of all empowering the voices of those who are currently disenfranchised. The research oriented authors, institutions, funding agencies and governments who already have economic barriers whether to research access or to dissemination but whom we would like to include in our more equitable and therefore more productive <coughs> future. This, I think, as well relates to a point that Leslie Chan made at the opening, in his opening remarks, around uh, the need for balance and representation. I do believe that LPUB is perhaps a really excellent forum because it could provide that kind of diverse international and multidisciplinary perspective that I believe is needed to approach this solution. But one thing I will say, and here I will finish, so we have a little time for questions, but I think, which is that the question I've posed actually can't be answered without questioning the long-term future of the academic journal. I mean, after all, last year was declared to be the 350th anniversary of the academic journal's birth. As we all know, it was marked by the publication 350 years ago of the first volumes of the Philosophical Transactions in London and the Journal des Savants in Paris in 1665, both of them. Such an anniversary surely provided an excellent opportunity to reflect on the value of perpetuating the dominance of the academic journal, a first world product intended for a first world audience. This opportunity seems to have been largely missed. But the question remains, designed to use a particular 17th century technology to solve a particular 17th century problem, does history in the modern period justify the academic journals and journal publishers' continued hegemony in the world of scholarly communications? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jared, for this talk. This is what we actually were hoping to get when we set the motto of the conference, and I'm absolutely grateful that everybody is traveling along. I think this is the, those are the talks that we need, and the floor is open for questions. Uh, I'm not sure if I have as, as a question as much as uh, a thank you. Uh, I just applaud you for 
your honesty and, and your straightforward nature in, in presenting this observation and I, I it is it's commendable and I really appreciate uh, you raising this very very important uh, tension that needs to be looked at really seriously thank you well, thank you very much thank you Thank you very much. I agree with your overall talk. Still, I will ask, I'd like to ask two questions, maybe first one and the other one, which are rather critical. The first one is about financial streams. So in the old model, you had financial streams for books, so readers paid money to access the content. Now you have author processing charges, authors pay money. As soon as you talk about financial streams, people or nations or agents with less economic power will be disadvantaged, right? That was the case in the old system. Now you say, okay, we have this new system with APCs and that will disadvantage those agents which have less economic power. But that's true for all financial streams which you have, right? So the only way to avoid those poorer countries uh, to be disadvantaged would be to have no financial streams whatsoever or an, a new, another kind of socio-political world order, so which is not going to happen very soon. So I think it's not fair to advance that argument against APCs. I can see a lot of arguments against APCs, but that I think is not fair. Um, the other comment is about disruptive innovation. And do you think that there's a principled argument for disruptive innovation being preferable to sustainable innovation. I can understand that we all want this market to be disrupted and that the, the big players which we have today should be replaced by other players, right? Um, but that, I think that's an emotional approach that we have. We just won't, don't want to see them anymore, right? Uh, but I don't think saying that sustained innovation is bad and disruptive innovation is good. It's founded. I can imagine markets which live very well with sustained innovation. And it would be surprising if the big players with all the money they have would not just jump on, on the bandwagon and offer other publishing solutions under an ABC model. Thank you so much for, for both of those questions. I, I'll, I'll try and answer them. Um, but I think you know they, they hit two nails on the head. Um, the first one, I would say, the reason a lot of us, and I don't know who that is, but it does include me, uh, became interested in open access, was not because of an economic framework. It was not because of a business model. It was because of social equality. It was a desire to bring two previously underrepresented uh, communities the possibility for their research to be to be given the same attributes as was already uh, available to developed nations and developing nations. So my only answer is, you know, if you look at it in an economic framework, the, the kinds of models I was describing look fine. I reject personally, and I think there are many other people in open access circles who, who reject the idea that an economic framework will provide the answer. I think we need to look beyond that. And I think technology has allowed us to do that. That's the other beautiful thing, is that we are now in a, in a, in a world where actually technology is, is not the problem. So that's what I would say to that. Um, you remind me your second point. Uh, disruptive oh, disruptive innovation. Yes. So I would say that in, I would certainly not say that in all cases, uh, disruptive innovation is better than sustaining innovation. But I would say, uh, I, I, well, my comparison to, of the scholarly communication system, to me it's like a broken bicycle, right? One, a couple of the wheels are missing from the bicycle. It seems to me that you're not going to be able to get anywhere on a bicycle that doesn't have any wheels right now. And the sustaining innovation will make the uh, you know, it'll make the, 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 the bicycle bell work better. It'll maybe provide a, a, a glossier pump. 
It'll maybe do lots of other things. It'll, it'll make it look very beautiful, but it won't add wheels. And I think that's where we are. I think we are at a time where we have a broken system to address. And so I think that disruptive innovation is the critical path forward in that case. I don't believe that sustaining innovation will help. And if I'm honest, I don't think that those um, publishers who have a responsibility to their shareholders to maximize profit are going to be part of the solution. We can't cuddle up close to them and hope that they will somehow change their ways. They're not designed as corporate entities to change their ways. Those would be my uh, first thoughts. But thank you for the questions, they're both good. Yeah. Just a Sorry. quick question which actually follows on from what was just said. Um, the, um, it, it strikes me that there might be a way to put at least one wheel on the bicycle short term, um, which would be to involve publishers to, to where they are charging APCs. Could it not be that they are mandated to give a certain percentage of waivers um, so that people from disadvantaged backgrounds can apply for those? Um, I, I work for a Frontiers Media, which is a fully digital, fully open access, but we do charge APCs. We also have a full waiver system. So if people genuinely can't afford it, they can apply and we will give them a waiver. Now surely that could be mandated on a larger scale, at a national level even, where there are a lot of open access um, initiatives happening at national level now. Could they not mandate that for publishers? Do you think there's a way forward there? So, you know, so maybe, and there are, there are multiple ways forward. To me, that sounds like benevolent cap capitalism, effectively. It sounds like a way to be patronizing towards people. Oh, by the way, you can get a grant. It's okay. And, and who, who actually controls the amount of money that is going into that system? I perceive that to be um, perhaps one of the many ways that will be chosen, but it won't be my preferred path, I have to tell you. <laughs> Um, because, because the problem is that we don't have the right people in the room telling us what the solution is. To me, that is the fundamental problem. It's this inclusivity that we need to promote. And we will find perhaps that all our good intentions don't lead exactly to the direction we were hoping to get. I'm sorry, I'm taking up more time. So, one more question. Yes, I think we're hitting a really central node here and a very important point. I can only respond to both commentators uh, in the following way. If you really think of the phase of publishing as being really an integral part of the research cycle, and if you, if you feel about, if you think about the way in which that research cycle is presently supported financially, uh, then the problem essentially disappears because the cost of publication is somewhere around 1% of the cost of research. Even in poor countries, even in poor countries where there is a research budget, it is possible to support a platform which will be free for the, uh, gratis for the authors and free in all senses of the word free for the readers. The, the examples that have been uh, uh, offered by both Cielo in Latin America and Redalic are very good examples of, of that kind of philosophy. The, the argument that uh, there is a financial flow which immediately is going to create a, an inequality is both in a sense true and at the same time completely desperate because then that means that as soon as we do anything, which of course will always imply some cost, we'll always create inequality. And, uh, and of course I can't accept that. You know, I just philosophically cannot accept that. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like submitting to, to, the, to the flow of efforts as if those already have will be advantaged with regard to those who have not and there is no way to re-equilibrate anything. Well, when we do things like uh, graduated income tax in countries, we do a redistribution of wealth precisely to, to correct these kinds of inequalities. And uh, when Germany agrees to accept one million refugees, that's an extraordinary gesture of redressing an inequality. Uh, so there are ways of doing it. We shouldn't be in a situation, it seems to me, that uh, some economic 
iron law is going to dictate the way we must behave, including ethnically.